Our next panel is called Dissecting Police and Civilian Interactions. It's an exploration of the culture and practice of policing and how police are viewed by citizens of color and members of certain communities. Our moderator, moderator today will be Professor Barry Friedman, who is the Jacob D. Fuchsberg Professor of Law at New York University, Affiliated Professor of Politics and Director of the Policing Project. Our panelists include Lori Lightfoot, President of the Chicago Police Board, Retired, re retired Chief Harold Medlock Fateville, from the Fayetteville Police Department, Assistant Chief Perry Tarrant from the Seattle Police Department, He's also the president of Noble, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. We also have Samuel Sinyangwe, co-founder of Campaign Zero, and David Sklansky, Stanley Pro Morrison Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. Please welcome our panelists. Thank you. Uh, I'm Barry Friedman, my inner yogi. Appreciated the breathing exercise before we got started today. Uh, or on this panel. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, civilian police interactions and particularly lead to a conversation about uh, deadly force. I am going to uh, take the fact that I have the microphone to do a little self-promotion, which is I have a book out on uh, policing, and I'm going to be talking at Regulator Bookstore at 7 o'clock tonight. So if anybody wants even more policing, there'll be an opportunity for some. Uh, we, we have uh, organized ourselves a bit on the fly, and we're going to have a conversation that I'm going to just try to lead up here. Uh, and what I'd like to do is use the conversation to tease apart three particular problems that often get mixed in together. And it's easy to understand why, but I think that we might learn more from one another if we untangle them. So the first thing that I'm going to hope to have us talk about a bit is just the role race plays in police-civilian encounters, period. Then I want to start to move to the question of force and to discuss why force is used in policing and how it's used, and then again how race might affect that. <clears throat> and finally move to the question of deadly force uh, and, and, and what I was told was part of the focus of this panel. So I'm going to start by just asking a question of Samson Yangwe, which is, uh, you know, I should just say this before we get started, which is that my sense from talking about these issues all over the country is that there's a great deal of passion uh, and a lot of facts, but it's sometimes hard for us all to understand the other side, just as a practical matter, to learn from it. And so I want to take some time on the panel today to uh, let us just learn, learn about how people feel about why things happen factually, what policing is like, what the experience of being policed is like, uh, and then move toward our points. So I want to ask Sam, if he will, just to tell us whether and how being policed is different if you are a person of color than it is, as best as you can perceive from the work that you have done, if you are not a person of color uh, in ways that might affect the nature of those encounters? Sure, so, and that's a deep question, so I'm gonna try to be uh, as succinct as possible. You know, policing is one aspect of a broader system, and I think the previous panel spoke to the system um, system of white supremacy. And when we talk about disparities, racial disparities in treatment with regard to policing, it's important to note that that occurs in every domain of American life, right? So whether it is the quality of health that, healthcare that you are provided if you are black uh, versus if you are white, whether it is uh, the treatment that you get from the other aspects of the criminal justice system beyond policing. What we know to be true is that institutional racism takes place in all of the domains uh, in our life and that we need to address all of them. When we talk about policing specifically and how it impacts black people, there are many different ways in which it impacts, right? And so the first thing is the ways in which the law is applied differently depending on if you are white versus if you are black. And one of the most illustrative uh, points of that is uh, marijuana possession, marijuana arrests, right? So, um, you know, if you are black, you are about three and a half times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession, despite the fact that black people and white people uh, possess marijuana, use marijuana, deal marijuana at similar rates. Um, and so that means that your risk of doing the same thing is higher if you are a black person. That means your anxiety is higher. The threat uh, of an encounter with an armed police officer is higher. Um, 
and that transcends every phase of the criminal justice system, right? So it could start with contact. It also involves your interaction with that police officer, right? So a study from the Center for Policing Equity showed that controlling for all other factors for crime rates and you know behavior during an interaction, et cetera, et cetera, um, police were more likely to use force against black people in the process of making an arrest uh, than they were against white people, right? When we look at deadly force, right, the next sort of tier um, of threat, right? So starting with your likelihood of being encountered by a police officer for the same thing, oftentimes for nothing at all if you're black, to your likelihood of force being used against you, you being harmed in that interaction, to your likelihood of being killed during that interaction is higher. You're about three times more likely to be killed by police uh, if you're black than if you're white. Uh, and though, again, those disparities persist even after controlling for things like police contact and crime rates, et cetera, right? And so what I'm saying is that ultimately your threat, uh, the threat that you feel, the anxiety that you feel, your likelihood of being harmed by the state is higher if you're black in, in whether you are walking down the street, uh, whether you are doing something that a white person who's doing the same thing would have a different response by the state. So that is sort of the world that you live in if you're black, right? Um, and I think what's important to note is that this is something that policies and practices participate in allowing to happen, in encouraging, right? And so when we look at the ways in which the law is constructed to give police leeway, uh, to engage however they want to engage during those interactions, that there is no accountability structure structure with independent investigations and prosecutions uh, of deadly force, for example. We see that, you know, in fact, the same biases that many of us have, in fact, the majority of people have anti-black bias in this country, uh, according to uh, the Implicit Association Test Project Implicit at Harvard. But those biases in the hands of somebody who is armed, a police officer, can prove deadly. Right, and so I think what that's what we see when we look at the numbers. Great, that's that's terrific, Sam. So what I want to do now is we have two uh, chiefs on the dais here. We've got uh, retired Chief uh, Harold Medlock from Fayetteville, who uh, I've never met, and Assistant Chief Perry Tarrant from Seattle, who I just met. Uh, and I want to just toss a couple of questions that come out of uh, what Sam had to say to the two of you. So you know, as as I understand and distill what Sam said, and forgive me if I get it wrong, Sam, there's legitimate anxiety that happens in these encounters. Uh, and then on the face of that legitimate anxiety, there's a great deal of police discretion about what can happen during the encounters. And so I want to ask the chiefs, I'll start with Chief Tarrant, uh, you know, whether this is, whether there's consciousness on the part of departments that there is this additional anxiety, whether there's training that addresses it. Uh, you might want to say a word about you know, conscious or unconscious uh, bias training. So why don't we start there? Sure. <clears throat> and, and good morning to, to all of you, and thanks for being here. Um, first of all, before I got into policing, I was black. When I leave policing, I'll be black. So I totally get the, the anxiety um, with, with that scenario. Um, but more importantly, uh, my story and how I got into law enforcement is uh, not that unusual or not that unique. First of all, when I was going to a school, uh, law enforcement and policing was was nowhere on my radar, as it is for most African American males. Um, my my involvement and in how I got into law enforcement had to do with being stopped. I was stopped one night leaving uh, leaving campus. I did not like the way that contact went, so my choices were to um, live with it or try to have an impact on the system. So that's how I got into policing, with the intent of changing those contacts. Contemporarily, what you're seeing uh, within law enforcement is a shift in, into paying more attention to who we're recruiting and who we're bringing into the system. Uh, and the reason why is, is because historically, uh, there was a, uh, a desire to bring folks in, into law enforcement that were already battle tested. I do not have a military background. I was, ne I was never in the military. My father was. I moved, I moved around a lot as a military brat. Um, but um, I don't have a military background. But that was who we recruited, he very heavily recruited historically. One of the things I learned when I lived in the UK was that it was called the police service as opposed to law enforcement. There is, there is a big difference there. And when you talk about the history of policing <coughs> in the US um, and how policing got started, two, con two completely different systems all the way around. And you heard some of that earlier this morning. But 
when you when you start talking about who we're bringing in policing now, we're looking for folks who have greater socialization, and more importantly, we've made a very conscious effort to shift a lot of our training internally to not only identifying those biases and, and helping our personnel identify their own individual biases, but being able to put them in check in order to do the job. And that's really what we want. The, the bottom line is, is everybody has a bias. It's what you do with that bias and how it affects your, your, your daily interactions with the community. And that's where we're putting a lot of our investment and a lot of our time and a lot of our money. And I will tell you that training absolutely has a, a huge financial impact, but the, out, the, but the outcomes are much more devastating, devastating if you don't put the money into the system in the first place. Chief Medlock, do you want to follow up? Sure. I, I just want to say that, <clears throat> the, the, as Perry said, that the, the officers that we're bringing on today are better educated. Uh, they have a better world view. Um, they are, um, they're much more integrated into society than people my age. Uh, I started policing in 1979, and, and I was one of those that was tested because it was a military police department that, that I joined, and, and uh, being one like you, I, I had no military background, so I was tested. Uh, by police officers, those battle-tested police officers. We're not looking for that, I hate to use the P word here, that profile of person uh, anymore. We're looking for that well-rounded, well-educated person uh, that has a, a broader view than people my age. And I, I, I don't know what to tell you beyond that um, as far as a, a type of person we're trying to attract into this profession. I absolutely agree that uh, we in this country need to begin a movement uh, away from police departments and away from uh, law enforcement and make this truly a police service because we are a service to the community. We are public servants, and that's how we need to start uh, uh, viewing ourselves. So how do we jumpstart? How, how do we move beyond uh, some of the things that have happened in the last couple of years? Uh, absolutely uh, bias-based uh, training, uh, where we, again, spend time with our officers and our employees, uh, helping them identify the fact that we all, everyone in this room, has biases. You may not want to admit it, but the fact is we all do. Uh, there's something uh, deep down in our background that uh, that holds uh, a personal bias against a thing or a person or a group. So if we can help our officers begin to identify those issues that, that we carry around, that I carry around, that you carry around, that they carry around, as they're dealing with the public, they're able to um, overcome those biases. You can't erase them. You cannot erase them. We're not robots. Uh, we are living, breathing, thinking, emotional human beings. And then finally, I would tell you that uh, de-escalation, I hate to use the word training because you train a dog, uh, you teach people, but teaching people, teaching our people who are police officers de-escalation techniques. You know, yesterday I was on the phone with uh, the power company because my power was out 24 hours. The first thing they told me was this call is gonna be monitored for quality assurance. No, it wasn't. It was going to, they were telling me, calm down, Junior, because we've got, we're going to have you on a recording. And so they set the stage right then. And every customer service event that you, uh, you have in contact with somebody, they're setting the stage that um, we're going to begin to de-escalate your problem and your issue right from the beginning. And that's what we need to do. We'll probably talk a little bit more about this later, but there's two words that if we can adopt in the police service business, it's slow down. Thank you. So I'm going off the script already, and I apologize to everybody up here. I'm, everybody's been very good about being crisp, and I'm just going to throw questions out as they occur to me. And I want to talk about uh, culture within institutions, and I'll, I'll turn to David Sklinski in a moment to do that. And I want to talk about the bias training and what we think we know about whether it works. But everything sounds a little bit too rosy to me, actually, already. And so I want to turn to Lori Lightfoot, because I'm hearing that we're you know, dealing with these issues by 
hiring a new breed of officers, which is great to hear, but Lori's here from Chicago, and I will tell you that I have read 10 years I've done you know, just intense reading about policing, and one of the most depressing things I've ever read was the DOJ report on the Chicago Police Department, and particularly the last third of it or so that was about interactions with the community. And so you know, I just would love, and, and in fact, I'll, I'll introduce the other thing you wanted to talk about, I know, Lori, which is, uh, you know, Lori has asked me painfully on any number of occasions, how do you think about communities that, in which the police are just simply delegitimated? So I'm curious to hear a, a less rosy version of the story if you have it, and then we can move to solutions. Well, you know I do, which is why you turned to me. Um, <laughs> l let me give you a little bit of context for the comments that I'm going to make. Um, there was a reference in the earlier panel to the release of the video um, showing the death of Laquan McDonald, shot 16 times by um, the last officer that arrived on the uh, scene. All the other officers recognized that I think the, uh, the Laquan McDonald really posed no real threat. Uh, they were giving time and distance the kind of training on de-escalation um, <coughs> that, that they're taught. But this last officer who rushed to the scene, jumped out of his car and started shooting, across his partner who, and almost you know, uh, felled him, emptied his um, gun, 16 bullets, and then started to reload before somebody stopped him. So in get that context, um, I have been very involved in all things policing in Chicago. And I think what we find, and, and again, my, 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 I'll speak from my experience, we, we still live in a very segregated world. Um, and even if we live in communities that are not as segregated by housing as Chicago is, uh, we still self-segregate and don't interact as often as we can with people who are different from us wh in whatever way we define that difference. That is absolutely true in policing, but it co poses very significant problems. In Chicago, we are one of the most segregated uh, cities in the country. We recruit from segregated neighborhoods. And our young police officers, when they come to the academy, may be meeting somebody who looks different than them, who has a different experience for the first time mm -hmm. as a peer. And yet, unfortunately, still, we do not account for that in the way in which we recruit, in the way in which we train, um, whether it's young officers or more veteran officers. That is a problem, particularly the young officers who then, because of the vagaries of a crazy union seniority system, get forced to go into the most dangerous neighborhoods in the city on the midnight shift with little more than a badge and a gun and told to do their job. But I think one of the challenges that we have and we must overcome is bringing the community back into <laughs> policing. And I don't simply mean the kind of traditional community policing models. One of the things that we've been pushing for in Chicago, and I'm determined that we get there, is that we introduce people from the community from different neighborhoods into the training that is actually done in the academies. Some of you may be from communities where that standard fair has been going on for some time, not so um, in Chicago, and, and the reason that's important beyond the things that I've already said is <clears throat> when police officers who are going into neighborhoods that they are unfamiliar with, and particularly if they're segregated neighborhoods that are, that are a majority of a race that is different than their own, they bring with them all of their preconceived notions about what that means. And you know, you've heard this phrase, but I'll say it again, that everybody who lives in a violent crime plague neighborhood isn't a criminal. And that seems obvious, but is not a point that is dealt with, trained, um, trained on, talked about, however you want to um, characterize it, for our officers. So I think what is driving the more outrageous and salacious incidents that we are all familiar with across the country is a basic um, under misunderstanding and certainly fear. And you know, let's also deal with another reality, which I think is important for us to <coughs> level set on. We have chosen as a society to say that we want the police to be armed. The, the, uh, one of the um, speakers on the previous panel talked about we have to demilitarize the police, we have to de um, uh, unarm them. That's obviously not realistic, and I'm assuming that was done in a rhetorical flourish. But you know, we have neighborhoods in Chicago that are every bit as violent and dangerous as some of the worst uh, um, third world countries or, or war zones. In those circumstances, you're not going to find anybody who's a police officer who's going to go in there without a gun. 
But what we also have to do is make sure that when they are equipped to use force, that they're actually well trained and that they recognize the sanctity of life as the first principle in using force and that force should only be used um, in, as, in as little increments as possible. But that really, I think, requires a sea change in the way we think about policing, the way in which, again, we think about recruiting, what the job is, what's the job description for the police, and then that is going to, I think, define the way in which police interact. I'll stop here, but I, another point that I hope that we'll come to is what's our role as citizens in changing the narrative in the discussion and in encounters with police? And I think we have a bigger role to play. You, you know, there has been a lot of commentary, and rightfully so, about the abuses that people have suffered on the, at the hands of police. Recognizing that history and that reality is really important. One of the earlier panelists talked about what has been a game changer, cameras everywhere, has totally changed the narrative. But now that we see what is going on out there, I think if we're going to live in a society that moves towards a better place, and I think of this in terms of the, the, the people in the neighborhoods who are the, the, least, the most vulnerable, who are most likely to be victims of violent crime, we need to be thinking about those folks because they need the police. They need constitutional policing. They need respectful engagement with the police, but they need the, re the police. We have too many children across this country, particularly in urban centers, that learn the concept of duck and cover before they learn their ABCs or their colors. And that is ridiculous, and we have to stop that. But we ha can only get there if we start moving towards a productive narrative focused on solutions. So uh, what I've heard, and I think it's worth remarking on and everybody noticing, is that there's a story being told that on both sides of these encounters, there's fear, there's anxiety. And I do want to shift the conversation back around to training in, in a way I hadn't particularly anticipated, because it doesn't you know, take rocket science to know that when two sides are going into an encounter afraid, it, that's not a good prescription for things to end up well. And we should talk a little bit about it. Before we do, I want to shift over to David Sklansky and bring him into the conversation. David's written a terrific amount about the internal processes of police departments, about police culture. He's, he's uh, perhaps the leading national expert on this stuff. And I'm just curious, David, to hear you speak to the extent to which internal uh, cultures in police departments play into the question of, of the racial nature of uh, police citizen encounters. Sure. Well, I, I, there's not just one police culture today. The cultures vary from department to department, and w within departments there are different cultures. Um, that's a big change from 50 years ago when there was pretty much one police culture everywhere in the United States, and it was white, male, homophobic, racist, and virulently reactionary. Um, still, I think um, even, in, in, even in departments with much healthier um, cultures than we had um, 50 years ago, uh, there's high levels of fear, uh, mistrust, and uh, a feeling of being misunderstood and put upon um, by rank officers. And uh, I, th I think that that's something that needs to be addressed in any comprehensive uh, effort at reform. That kind of um, feeling of vulnerability uh, lends itself to uh, the kinds of uh, unconscious racism that we've been talking about this morning. Um, but I also think that uh, it's not enough to talk about debiasing individual officers. We need to be debiasing institutions. And one important step to doing that is to uh, complete uh, the demographic transition that we began 50 years ago. There are still lots and lots of departments. Ferguson's a good example where it, it's, it, the, the department still is not integrated. It's still um, uh, disproportionately white, male. Um, and uh, having uh, an integrated police force <laughs> is far from a panacea. Chicago is a good example of that. Um, but uh, I, I think it's an important, necessary step toward moving forward. Good. So I, I want to turn back to the chiefs for a moment. And I want to ask you two different questions about training. So one is. I think it would probably interest all of us to hear a little bit about what debiasing training looks like for uh, unconscious or conscious racial biases. So that I, I think we'd like to know a bit about that. And I'm I'm certainly interested if, if folks on the panel or in the room know much about the 
how effective that training is. I mean, I've heard mixed stories about that. But I'm also interested to know something about whether training encompasses the fact that officers are thrust into situations in which both they and the person with whom they are dealing are afraid, and how to think through encounters like that in a way in which we can avoid bad things happening. I, I, whichever one of you wants to jump in. Sure. One of, the, one of my favorite quotes that I've heard uh, over and over again over the last couple of years is uh, the, nine one, the call to 911 f for police comes after every other system has failed. So when mental health systems have failed you, and you have an issue, you pick up the phone and you call the police. When someone is having a medical issue uh, as related to drugs or narcotics, you pick up the phone and you call the police. When uh, one of the calls I had where a parent couldn't get their child to go to school, they picked up the phone and they called the police. So when we're, when we're training uh, uh, cops to deal with a, 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 just a broad spectrum of situations, it's, it's very, very challenging. Uh, in the city of Seattle, we now outfit every patrol cop with a, with a, a Narcan pen because we're seeing that level of overdose. We spend a lot of time dealing with, um, in the training capacity, with mental health. We tracked uh, over, the, over 2016, more than 9,300 contacts with somebody in some very stage of a mental crisis. So we, we spent a lot of time training our folks to de-escalate. And what that de-escalation training is based on is, um, what, and you heard the two words, slow down, add distance if you can add distance, and if there's an opportunity where we have the capacity to then engage other social services, we try to bring them on board so it's not a police issue, ultimately. I mean, sure, it may start as a police contact, but when we have that, that officer, and using the scenario that you heard in Chicago, that brand new officer who's got the least amount of training and the least amount of ex experience in dealing with those scenarios is put into those areas where that's most likely to occur. We, we talk about policing having to be perfect every single time, but we hire human beings to do the job, and we know human beings are fallible. And sometimes the human being factor supersedes the desired outcome in that police contact. But yet we fully expect policing to be done correctly 100% of the time. So as we, as we work through training, and, and our larger issue of training as it relates to policing today, is we're trying to catch up to a whole bunch of other social systems and social issues with that one officer to solve very large issues that are well beyond that, that capability of that officer. So I, I'm going to tell you, um, bias-based policing training uh, that we have gone through uh, was designed by Dr. Lori Friedel of University of South Florida. And, and you know what? It's not perfect. But it's all we had. And it's all we continue to have. Um, so varying, whether that training is received with varying uh, degrees of success um, is based on the individual. It's also based on the leadership of the police department. If the leaders are given lip service to it but aren't uh, practicing it, the cops aren't going to buy into it. <coughs> cops are going to do exactly um, and, and take on the persona of the leadership of a, uh, a police department or sheriff's office. Uh, so if you have a leader that's not uh, not vested in it and and doesn't do anything more than pay lip service to it uh, it's not gonna it's not gonna take hold we as a profession spend a lot of time trying to identify the perfect candidate to be a police officer and then we put them through our training we, we do we do psychological testing to make sure that they're normal the most normal people that we can find to be uh, police officers. And then we immediately turn them into abnormal individuals based on the work that they have to do. We're not, we're not perfect, we're, we're learning. 
we, we're, we're, you give us something. You give us something uh, that will help us keep our people normal uh, and, and uh, paying attention to uh, surroundings and people and differences. And a good police department will embrace uh, and do that. I believe that uh, engaging the public uh, in this training is absolutely critical. Uh, so we brought in members of our community who volunteered their days to come and go through this training with us. And it allowed us to, to, to evaluate them. Guess what? They evaluated us too. And it, it changed their perception of us and our perception of them. So I want to move us to force, but first Lori Lightfoot tugged at my sleeve here to just say something about the debiasing training. So I, I'm going to place my comment in kind of a larger context. Um, um, I view the police departments in every community as one of the most important institutions. That's my perspective. <coughs> but what I've found in Chicago and looking across the country is that the police departments themselves don't view themselves in that same way, um, in part because they spend so little energy and resources investing in their most important asset, which is their people. When, in, when we, I was chair of a police accountability task force in Chicago, one of the things that we did is looked at, well, what are the training and investments that have been made by the department? We have the second largest police force in the country. And what we found is that once you graduated from the police academy, you could spend the next 25, 30, 40 years of your career and not have any more mandatory annual training other than firearms qualification which is 30 bullets into a paper target. If you think about any other institution that you know where it, the people are the most important assets, it's unconscionable in my view for how little we have invested in training and, and equipping and continuing to teach officers as they evolve from 20-something year olds to 55, 60 year old men and women over the course of their career. So the one thing that I wanted to challenge the chief on a little bit in, in, in the friendly uh, back and forth here is, it's not rocket science. The bias training, corporations, universities have been doing this training for years. You can, and I can give you a list of like five or 10 people that could come in and help. It, it's, it, what is needed is the leadership and the will to do it. Um, and if you don't have that, then you're gonna find yourself frustrated and say, well, we have this, but it's not that great. And, and again, I don't mean to b belittle your comments, but, but part of what needs to happen across police departments everywhere in our country, and particularly in our larger cities, is somebody actually has to give a damn about changing the narrative. And part of changing the narrative is about making sure that every officer, regardless of their background, is able to police in every neighborhood in your community, regardless of where they come from. That takes a lot, but if that focus and determination isn't there and the leadership doesn't embrace that as a core mission, then we're gonna continue to fail and we're gonna continue to see the next sensational shooting death in custody because we haven't committed ourselves to making things better. Could, could, I, could, I, could I just respond to that? Yes, of course. Amen. That's the kind of crisp statement that I welcome here. So uh, I, I, I want to turn to the question of the use of force. And I actually want to go back to the chiefs, though I'm conscious I've cut Sam out now for a while, so I promise I'm coming your way. But I, I just want to start to talk about force, because I was at a gathering where you know, a very well-respected chief uh, said, you know, people don't want to deal with what policing is, which is that it involves a great deal of force, sometimes of brutality. And that's, that is what the job requires at times. And I'll also tie that to the fact that uh, you know, I think that Chief Tarrant rightly points out that officers often are stuck dealing with the, um, the social problems of society, that society's not picking up to deal with itself. But it is also true, you know, we haven't talked about the P-word profiling, but that there are plenty of encounters that are, that are not the mentally ill and that are just, you know, ordinary citizens being stopped by, by police officers and some of those turn bad. So I think what I want to do is just start by asking uh, Chief Medlock and Chief Tarrant to, to just say a word of education to us about how to think about the use of force. Because I think uh, very often 
civilians are troubled by force, but don't think about it through the eyes of officers that feel the need appropriately at times to use it. And then we can pivot to inappropriate uses of force. But let's just start there. So, so there, there are people that just um, have committed a crime, just don't want to go to jail. And, and so you use only that force which is necessary to take them into custody. The, the, the real problem is when we have somebody that resists us, we can't leave. You don't expect us to leave. Oh, they don't want to do what I want, want them to do, so the police are going to get in their cars and leave. We can't do that. Mm -hmm. We would not be doing our job. So we don't have the choice and the luxury of leaving that encounter. But what we do have is the ability to slow things down. And I, I just want to, this is, it may be funny to some of you, but we've all seen it. Four cops pull up, young person, I don't care what color they are, gets out of the car, and all four cops are screaming at the same time. Show me your hands, get on your knees, get on the ground, get your hands out of your pocket, turn around, walk toward me. You know what we just told that person to do? Break dance. Okay? I mean, there, there are no, there's no clear direction. There's no one that appears to be in charge. We have to teach our people, we have to teach our people to slow the situation down and control it. We have all the time in the world. We need to tell our cops and remind our cops that we're not getting paid by the, by the call for service. If it takes eight hours and we have not resolved the situation, guess what? We've got more cops coming to work. They're fresh, they're rested, and they can take that over from us. We can stand there all day as long as we have control and nobody is getting hurt. So slow it down. So I'm just going to poke right in here just because I, one of the hats I wear is as the reporter for an American Law Institute project on policing. And we've got a group of people that are working on that as national advisors that scans the gamut from Black Lives Matter to police chiefs and prosecutors with plenty of community folks in between, advocacy groups. And the first part of our project that we've completed is on principles of use of force. And I was not the lead on that. Uh, two of my co-reporters, Brandon Garrett and Rachel Harmon at UVA were. But you know, one of the things that we end up saying challenges a bit of what you just said, though, which is, you know, makes me think about Eric Garner, which is, is it ever appropriate to walk away? That the amount of force required to achieve something is so out of line with what it is that society might have been trying to achieve in the first place that maybe it was a mistake. So, I just want to throw that out there. I want to give the chief a chance to say something, and then I'm going to ask Sam a question. Seattle Police Department is one of 97 cities currently under DOJ monitoring. In Seattle's case, it was for excessive use of force. We had to revamp our entire training system as it relates to the use of force, which involved a complete rewrite of all of our policies, and we absolutely involved the community in developing the policies that we now operate under. A lot of, um, the, a lot of our, our policies as it relates to the use of force absolutely require officers to, to carry intermediate systems to, um, to deal with resistance, and in addition to that, it requires the officer to document whether or not he or she attempted to de-escalate before the application of force. Um, I mentioned the mental health contacts earlier. Uh, when we, before we started tracking those, we really had no idea how often force was being used uh, to gain compliance or uh, to take someone into custody. 2016, when we did track those numbers, less than 1% of the contacts that we had resulted in any use of force. And that includes uh, de minimis use of force, and that's basically a, a soft hand contact. There is, a, there is that value in, in taking that additional time to develop training as it relates to use of force. The other hat I wear is the, the national president uh, for the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. And um, our organization, along with a few other peer organizations, just recently released a model policy for police departments to utilize as it relates to the use of force. 
Gary, if I could just jump in for a second. Sure. I think slowing it down is important. I think uh, knowing when to walk away is important, but not starting it is important too. <laughs> and we, we initiate too many coercive interactions with um, civilians in this country, and we do it in a racially biased way, and attacking that is an important part of the solution. Okay. So, so we could not have played this better if we'd worked on it in advance. Uh, I was just headed there, so, uh, and I was gonna go to Sam, but you should also feel free to jump in, which is to say, uh, you know, as I've listened to the conversation and as I listened to Chief Tarrant talk about, you know, issues of mental health and, and drug abuse and homelessness and all the things that the police have to deal with, but again, as David points out, a lot of the encounters between police and civilians are not that, and we are, living at a time when there is controversy about what I might call proactive policing. Uh, I could call it by other names, but, a, but the idea is to insert the police more often, uh, either through stop and frisk or through uh, traffic stops, followed by consent searches, if consent can be obtained. Uh, and so I'm just curious to start with Sam, though anybody should feel free to jump in, to ask the question about, and, and you know, to frame this, because you might have listened to the, this part of the story and thought I'm against all that. There's an argument for all that. I don't think we have very good data uh, about much of any of this, frankly, but uh, the argument in favor is that in the neighborhoods that Lori's talking about that are uh, deeply troubled with violence, that we need to increase the police presence, and this is a way of increasing the police presence. So I'll start with Sam, but just say, you know, is this, uh, I feel like I'm teeing up a ridiculous question, but but <laughs> people take it quite seriously, which is, you know, is this helpful or unhelpful, these, these forced encounters? So I would say unhelpful, and I would say that, you know, we have to think of policing as the most intense form of government intervention in anybody's life. Um, it is an armed person coming into your life with the power to make you do anything that they want you to do. Um, and that requires severe limits to be placed on the way that that power is used. Mm -hmm. And that involves reducing the amount of contact between police and communities in, in, that, in those types of ways. That means we need to be decriminalizing things that police don't need to be playing a role in enforcing, things like marijuana possession, things like somebody having an open container of alcohol uh, in the street, right? Somebody having a mental health crisis. There are uh, alternative solutions, there are alternative approaches to those behaviors that do not involve an armed person uh, coming in without training, trying to uh, essentially get somebody uh, to do what they want to do. Uh, so for example, we need to be investing in those other solutions. Oftentimes those solutions do not have, they may not have even been established. There isn't an alternative number to call of the 911. There isn't an alternative response. Um, and there isn't funding for it oftentimes. All the funding goes to police. Uh, and so how do we actually think about investing and scaling up alternative solutions uh, that have social workers, that have mental health providers, uh, crisis negotiators, and others dealing with these situations instead of police? I think the other piece is this question about force. And you mentioned the model policy and some of the reforms that Seattle has made. You know, we looked at the use of force policies of the 100 largest police departments, uh, city police departments in America. Uh, and what we found when we read through each of those policies was that there is huge variation in the level of restrictions placed on how and when officers use force just across police department policy. Um, and those restrictions actually are significantly correlated with the likelihood that those police departments use deadly force. So much so that we identified eight types of policies uh, that restrict in some way the way police officers can use force. Things like requiring officers to de-escalate situations when possible, uh, restricting deadly force to after an officer has exhausted all other reasonable means of apprehending somebody, um, having a use of force continuum, things like that. What we found was that police department, these eight things that we identified uh, were associated with a 72% reduction in uh, police killings, right? So a police department that implements all eight of these recommendations is 72% less likely to kill somebody than a police department that does not. And so that means that these policies matter, right? So the tr we talked a lot about training. I think training is important. When we look at training, we look at police recruits, the average police recruit gets 40 hours of firearms training, again, shooting uh, into a target, um, center mass, a kill shot, 
Um, they get about eight hours of de-escalation training, eight hours of training on how to interact with folks with mental illness. Uh, that makes no sense why it's 40 hours of firearms training and eight hours of training uh, on how to de-escalate situation and do the things that even the police chiefs up here are saying need to be done, right? And I think that needs to be flipped. Um, but beyond training, it's about the standards, right? It's one thing to, to have a particular training. It's another thing to be held accountable to a higher standard of conduct so that if you do not, if you violate those standards, there are accountability structures in place to hold you accountable. Um, and when we look at the use of force policies in police departments, the average department had three of those eight recommendations. Um, most police departments do not have a strong civilian oversight system with subpoena power uh, that is all civilian led, that is representative of the community, that has the power to discipline officers or influence department policy. Um, so all of these things, the structure itself uh, is deficient in so many different ways. And so we have to look at that structure and be very intentional, intentional about proposing comprehensive solutions. That's what Campaign Zero is about and, and many other organizations have proposed. And I think we still have not seen uh, a police department really commit to saying, you know, this is our comprehensive plan. These are our benchmarks and targets in terms of police violence, in terms of how many fewer uh, uses of force we want to have next quarter, the quarter after that, how many fewer police involved shootings we want to have. These are our goals that we want to achieve. Um, we haven't seen that happen, right? We haven't seen any sort of benchmarks to hold police departments accountable in terms of data um, being proactively proposed out, outside of a DOJ investigation. Um, and I think, you know, the, the last piece is this piece around, you know, we have the policies and the policies are only as important as they're being enforced by the police leadership and the culture of the police department uh, and by the uh, oversight structure. And so we also have to address the fact that you know, how are we actually involving communities in shaping that culture of the police department, in shaping um, the perceptions of the police officers and the police leadership? Are we seeing the folks most impacted by policing uh, playing an active role in shaping the trainings, playing an active role in shaping the policy, mm -hmm. playing an active role in deciding who the police chief gets to be? All of those things we have yet to see in, in, in many cities. So I want to just... Uh Sam rushed into deadly force, but I want to slow down like we've been taught to do. Uh, and so I want to talk about force for just one more minute and then wrap back around to deadly force because uh, I think some of the things you said initially are worth thinking about. And, and, and I actually inclined to go to David with this, which is, um, which is I'm still curious about this you know, number of encounters that occur and where it is that we should be cutting back those encounters. Sam gave this example of calling in other folks to deal with things that happen on the street, whether it's open containers or rowdy kids. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm, part of me wants to at least say, but ultimately, isn't there perhaps going to be some need for a threat of force in those situations? People can become belligerent. So I just wish you'd say a few words more about where we should be trimming the encounters that, we, that we're seeing and, and involving other folks in, the, in resolving them. I think we should be trimming them from what you call proactive, which are uh, stops um, and encounters that are not in reaction to a report of criminal activity. They're not in reaction to a complaint about antisocial activity. They're investigatory. They're um, uh, police officers executing a department policy to aggressively stop people based on suspicion that they might be carrying out a crime. Often, um, there needs to be a legal predicate. So when a, a car is pulled over, um, it, you need to have, the officer needs to have seen some violation. But almost everybody violates traffic rules. So police can pull over almost anyone they want to. When police are told, you should use traffic stops aggressively as a way to try to interdict drug traffickers, or when they're told, you should be stopping and frisking as many people as you can because we want to find people who have guns. And when that's done aggressively, that's that, that, those encounters, the investigatory encounters as opposed to the reactive encounters, are disproportionately likely to escalate into violence, partly because they are accurately perceived by minority communities to be racially targeted. Um, and, and I don't think that there's evidence uh, that uh, though that those aggressive policies uh, are an important part of driving down crime. Certainly in New York City, which was the poster child for this sort of approach, when the department was forced to roll it back, crime rates continued to fall. Good, thank you. I mean, I, you know, it's interesting. I'll just, uh, to quibble with the word only because I think it's instructive, you, you know, you distinguish these 
reactive from investigatory, and the word I like to use is deterrent, because investigatory implies, as you yourself said, that there's some level of suspicion, yeah. and deterrence, uh, you know, if you look at the number, I often say when you look at the hit rates in New York, that if there was, if there really was suspicion in the officers' minds driving those, then the officers weren't being trained very well to know what was suspicious, but that wasn't what was happening. There was just a call to have a lot of stop and frisks on the hope that you would deter people from carrying guns. Uh, I, I want to pivot to deadly force, but I, but I do want to ask either of the chiefs at the table whether they want to speak up on the issue that we've just been discussing about proactive policing and say something uh, to educate us about the value of it. Uh, and if not, I'm going to turn us to deadly force in particular. But, but you have the floor if either of you want. Amen. Uh, you know, I, I, took a, I took over a department four and a half years ago that had a, a horrible relationship with its community. And the reason I got the job was because the department had a really bad relationship with the community. They wanted change. And, and so what, we, what I found when I got there was a department that, that conducted a lot of what I call regulatory stops, the, the broken tail light, the expired registration, the, the headlight that's out, uh, the, the um, slowing down for a stop sign in a neighborhood. Not, uh, that's a moving violation, okay? But, but we, 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 I directed our folks to get away from that and start making stops. If you're gonna make a stop, make it for something that matters. Speeding, DWI, stop signs, stop light violations, those that, that hurt people. And you know, you know what happened, of course the cops are gonna show the new guy, our stops went way down in 2013. But we kept pushing that philosophy and our, our traffic, traffic fatalities were very high in 2012, 2013, we started making those moving violation stops for the purpose of, of correcting that behavior, that, that stop, and, and forget about trying to get in the car because what we found and what the national studies will tell you is we don't get that much out of consent searches. We, we just don't. Um, and, 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 oh God, I'm, somebody's gonna have to give me a ride back to Charlotte today because I'm sure the cops are gonna be looking for me now. But, but you really don't get that much benefit out of that search. What we found once our cops realized that we were saving lives, tra traffic fatalities go down, traffic stops for moving violations go up, complaints from the community go down, officer injuries go down, uses of force go down, and, and citizen injuries go down. And, and so now we've got a community in Fayetteville that has a pretty good relationship with a lot of other things that we've done but if you look at our regulatory stops, the, the, the fewer that we did, the more impact we made on, on really on community safety. So uh, the professor's right. I mean, it, it, it's, um, there's not a lot of uh, bang for the buck when you're, when you're bird dogging for, for drugs or for some reason to stop a, stop a car beyond a moving violation that can save a life. I just wanted to jump in and say that I, I think we have to have a little note of caution about backing away from proactive policing. Um, you know, we, in this discussion, we, I think it's very important for us to recognize, we don't start with a clean slate. We don't start with the opportunity to erase 200 years of history and culture. Uh, we are dealing with the current cards that we are dealt. That doesn't mean that we can't change things, but I think we have to be re realistic about what we want to change and I think we need, need to be more thoughtful about, about the policy. What the chief um, just talked about, which I think is really helpful, is thinking about policy and policing from what is the desired outcome and how do we get there, and thinking also about what are the um, unintended consequences. So for example, in Chicago, we had a police superintendent via New York, via Newark, um, and came to Chicago and said, stop and frisk works. So he issued, in effect, an edict, and by the time that got translated down to the, the street, officers were literally stopping grandmas in their nice old cars on their way to church. And, and what that did was created this widespread sense of anger and hatred of the police in black and brown communities, not just among 
20 something year olds, but among people of you know middle class, upper middle class, men and women, who historically you would think would have a good relationship with the police. So there wasn't thoughtfulness uh, behind the edict. Retrenchment, though, has led to other unintended consequences, which is one of which is in Chicago, raging violence. We went from hovering right around 450 homicides a year to last year we were almost at 800. Now, some of that is this whole issue of uh, the uh, proactive policing versus not proactive policing, but again, reactive um, policy shifts without thoughtfulness about how, behind what the consequences are. And so while I agree, low-level things, that shouldn't be what we are paying people 75000 to you know $150,000 a year to do, but sometimes those things happen and they're important. So but if, but I, I was just going to say, I'll finish and say, again, to me, it comes back to thinking about policing as something that has to be as every bit as thoughtful in public policy as anything else that we do, and training, 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 training. So if I could just make two quick points. One is, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that um, nobody thoughtful, uh, well, most people who are, uh, I don't think there's a good argument for saying that the police should never stop and frisk anyone. And I don't, I don't hear many people who work in policing uh, suggesting that. The, the question is how much you use that tool and in what ways. So when somebody like Donald Trump says we should do stop and frisk, that is a, it's, a, it's, it's not a helpful way to think. You need to think about how you. We should immediately be suspicious. Yeah. And <laughs> second, second, there are forms of proactive policing that are not coercive. And when people talk about wanting to pull back on proactive policing, what we're talking about is pulling back on coercive forms of proactive policing, not on other things the police can and should be doing proactively to help communities get safer. So let me, let me just jump in real quick here. Yeah. Sure. I was in a meeting last Thursday with uh, Attorney General Sessions, um, and it was m myself and a couple of, of my peers having that conversation, and stop and frisk did come up. And uh, there was clearly a divide in that room on, on whether or not we go back to stop and frisk. And the short answer is, is that there is value when it's done thoughtfully. But beyond that, just a blanket stop and frisk absolutely does not work. Um, I had the opportunity to spend uh, a lot of time in Ferguson post Michael Brown looking at their, that system. And in that community, policing was specifically used as a tool of oppression. You had 2.2 traffic-related arrest warrants for every citizen who lived in that community. And so that's a system failure, not just a policing failure. So I have an agenda, and I want you to know what it is so that we can pursue it. No, 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 I think this has been terrific. I, I just, we're going to actually cover everything. So we're going to do three things. We're going to talk about deadly force. We're going to talk about community engagement with these policies. And we're going to get some questions from you. And we're going to speed that up by doing the following thing, which is that I think Sam said a lot that was very true and right about deadly force. And we don't need to delve a lot deeper into it, ironically. At some level, the what seems like the biggest problem uh, may, in many ways, be one of the easiest to fix. And so I just want to offer this up and see if anybody on the table seriously disagrees with what I have to say. And if not, we can move to, to some other direction that I'd like to hit before we turn to the crowd, which is, um, and again, I've been very focused on this from, from working with the ALI principles. So, you know, a lot of the problem in this area, and I never like to hesitate for one moment picking on the courts when it comes to policing, is the Supreme Court. And, and it, they may not be held accountable for what has happened, but they've been used in the wrong way. So the Supreme Court has a test for when deadly force gets used uh, that basically asks, at the moment that force was employed, was there it was it objectively reasonable for the officer to use force in that situation. And there's two really big problems with the Supreme Court's test. So one of the big problems with the Supreme Court's test is it only looks at that immediate moment when the force is applied. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't reel back and look at whether, you know, for example, in the case of Tamir Rice, where there's a report that there's a male with a gun in a park, there's also a statement that it might be a kid with a toy gun, but that doesn't get to the officers. But what do the officers do? They go racing up to within a few feet of Tamir Rice, and within two seconds, shots have been fired. And so 
uh, you know, one could have a debate. I, 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 I have a view in it, but one could have a debate about exactly what's going on in that officer's mind right at that moment. But why don't we just wheel that police car back and uh, figure out whether that was the right approach in the first case? And the Supreme Court's test doesn't do anything about that. And the other thing it does nothing about is it's just too general. Just is it objectively reasonable? And there are lots of folks in policing right now that are fighting for the fact that the Supreme Court's test should be the test to evaluate force. But if any of you were running a police department and you had to train officers, you wouldn't train them by saying, well, the instructions we want to give you is just make sure what you do is objectively reasonable. And it would be ridiculous. You'd have protocols and careful policy and training that dealt with that. And so I think Sam's exactly right, and Operation Zero has done great work here to record what the policies look like, to think thoughtfully about what the effects are of having different policies and of then implementing those policies through training. So I'm gonna ask if people agree with that by and large, uh, and I'm gonna hope that we don't have long speeches because I wanna move to the next topic, which is how do we get those policies? So am I close? I always say you're 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 close. Um, <laughs> well, the, I used to one of the, the many jobs that I had is I worked for the police department investigating police involved shootings, um, and I think one of the challenges that we always had in thinking about this very esoteric use of force model is well, what were the circumstances that led to the officer to believe that he needed to use force? So your point about just looking at the the literally what was in the officer's mind, what were the circumstances at the time that the trigger was pulled misses, I think, a lot of context that both is important to understand how you got from the call or the encounter to now someone's on the ground with a shot um, in them or multiple shots in them. And I think it also misses an opportunity to learn from those circumstances where policies and practices might need to be changed to better equip the officer with the tools he or she needs to do their job more effectively. Well, and, and likewise, I've had the opportunity to investigate uh, quite a few officer-involved shootings. Uh, my background is uh, subject matter expert in police tactics, and, and your point is spot on with Laquan McDonald, and that is, were the tactics themselves the driver of the shooting? And more often than not, that is absolutely the case. Um, and if, when you start looking at a, at a variety of events that have occurred around the country, you, you have to you, you have to go left of where that trigger was pulled to look at whether or not what led up to it was was either caused by the officers or or ultimately caused by the scenario uh, as it, as the officers fed into it. Good. So I want to just shift the conversation to something that's uh, very near and dear to my own heart which is that folks up here have said, you know, we need policies, we have to bring the community in, we have to engage the public, we have to involve the community. So the first third of my book is about that because I think that's what we've lost in policing in the United States. I draw the distinction between front end and back end accountability. We spend all of our time, too much of our time focusing on whether there was misconduct when something bad happened. That's important, it's important to do sentinel event reviews and figure out what went wrong but we don't as a society spend nearly enough of our time on the kind of front end democratic involvement that we get in all the rest of government where folks are involved in knowing what the rules and policies are and having a voice in what they should be. So I'm, I'm thrilled to hear the discussion. I've started an organization at NYU Law School called The Policing Project. That's www.policingproject.org. Check us out. That's devoted to just that very issue. Uh, we're working all over the country on that. But I want to invite folks up here to just talk for a bit about the question of how we bring the community in. And I, I just want to pose a couple of questions, which is, uh, it's easy to say, in my experience, and really, really, really hard to do. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to do because it seems to me that it's a two-sided problem. On the one hand, even departments that are open to this, and there are plenty of departments that are not, but even departments that are open to it uh, are unfamiliar with it. And so they want to invite the community in, but I've been in gatherings where you know departments and officials at those departments that were very interested in having community input then realize what it means to be having the community having a voice in how they want things to happen, and that's, that's a shock. And so that's one side of the problem. And then the other side of the problem is uh, democracy is expensive. Involving the community is expensive. People have lives and children and jobs, and, uh, and many of the communities that are being policed in ways that have caused concern are themselves marginalized in various ways. Their socioeconomic stress, and so it's a lot of work to get the community involved. It's a lot of work to give the community voice. 
Uh, and I hear a lot of talk from you know, both sides about usual suspects, and some people stand up and claim to represent the community. So I'm just curious, you know, based on experience or thought, what each of you might say about how you accomplish this thing that sound that I couldn't agree more is extremely important, and all of you seem to believe that, and yet, you know, in my own experience, it's really still tough to do. I'll start, I guess. Um, and, and let me let me draw um, an example. Uh, I think you're absolutely right that it's critically important. Police departments operate under the consent of the, the governor. It's a fundamental concept of our democracy. Yet it is very, very difficult to do it, particularly if you're, if you're starting to do it in the middle of a crisis, if you don't have a well of goodwill that you can draw upon, if you don't have validators and spokespeople within the community that can speak to the goodwill of the people in the uniforms, even though this terrible thing has happened. Um, and I think it's also this, this time that we are in is very fraught. We have, I think, a very unfortunate extremes of a narrative, which is the police are all bad, they're evil, they're racist, all they want to do is kill us. Um, and the other extreme is if you criticize us, um, then you're terrible and you don't know um, and you're not supportive of the police. And we all know the truth lies somewhere in the murky, messy, middle, gray area, but it's hard to get to that point. For example, um, as the uh, president of the police board, we are mandated to have a monthly police board meeting at our meeting, we take final action on um, disciplinary actions related to police um, officers. Generally, once a month, we are announcing that we're firing a police officer for engaging in some manner of misconduct. We do our business before we open it up to public session. We do our work. We announce the disciplinary actions that we've taken against police officers. As I said, many times we're announcing that we've just fired somebody. Yet we get speaker after speaker that stands up, calls us everything under the sun but a child of God, and criticizes us for doing nothing and being part of the problem, not part of the solution. And, and I hasten to add, there's no scorecard in what we should be doing in terms of uh, taking action on police disciplinary matters. But the fact that people are seemingly so wed to the extreme of the narrative and not listening um, presents the ch very challenge that Barry, I think, has um, rightfully um, set on the table, which is how do you engage people in a respectful way, bring them into the conversation, but do it in a way that you're actually recognizing the pain and the anger and the frustration that's out there, critically important, but do it in a way that actually eventually leads to solutions. Because I know from the police officer perspective, look, I think the, uh, the ownership of that relationship in some ways and the problems in it really lies for the most part with the police department. But there's no officer, no matter how well intentioned, that wants to stand there day after day, community meeting after community meeting, and get beaten, bloody, um, and think that they are going to then turn around and say, thank you, sir, may I have another, And let, but let's like seem kumbaya at the end. That's not gonna happen. So constructing the circumstances in which those conversations can happen, and doing it, I think, on lots of different tiers, some of it's gotta be outside of the, in private, small settings, where there are no reporters, where there are no cameras, so the rawness of the emotion on both sides can happen, but it can be done in a way that's facilitated. There are obviously opportunities in times where having big, messy public he hearings is a part of the process, but I think we've gotta be a lot more thoughtful about what do we wanna actually accomplish? And I'll go back to a point that I said before and then I'll stop. I think police departments are the most, one of the most important institutions in any community, not just the government uh, institution, any institution. And we need to take more ownership of make, thinking about what those institutions should look like. We need to stay engaged and not just marching in the streets when there's a problem. And we, need, again, need to think about they're there to protect the most vulnerable of, amongst us. And so how do we, in thinking about that and critical imperative, do form policies, hire people, train, continue and engage in a way that involves all of us in whatever the objective is that we want to meet. So I'll say a couple things. I think, one, when we think about community engagement, who is the community that we're thinking about? Oftentimes when we, 
the people who show up to the meetings and the people who are most engaged in the process are not the people most impacted by policing. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And there has to be an intentional effort. Because people have been so impacted by policing, there is a reasonable skepticism and a reasonable um, fear of being in those spaces. And so how is, whether it's the police department or another agency tasked with doing this as being sort of an intermediary, how are we creating spaces for the people most impacted by policing to show up and play a role in shaping how policing impacts them? Um, and I think that there are very few places that do that intentionally, that have a program to do that at scale that impacts all of the different ways that policing works, right? What, showing up to the training, right? How are police being trained? Who is training them? Uh, is it the people who have experienced what policing is like uh, as the recipient of uh, police using force against them or police arresting them who know what that experience is like that are able to communicate that to police officers and say, you actually should be doing this instead? Um, does that happen? Are we creating spaces for people most impacted to be leading those trainings, to be paid to lead those trainings, right? Instead of hiring a consultant from Washington to come in and talk about implicit bias and give a nice PowerPoint, are we actually hiring young black men to show up and say, this is how bias impacts my life. Here is how you can do it a little bit differently. Uh, here's what I think you should be doing to interact differently with my community. Um, those are the, that is the kind of democratic engagement that needs to happen. I think the other piece is around this, you know, you talked about uh, the disciplinary process and, you know, I do think that the vision is important, right? I think the community needs confidence that the police department is committed to doing things very differently. Um, and that confidence is earned, right? And so how is it that, you know, in Chicago, for example, um, the Chicago Police Data Project, um, it has access to all of the uh, civilian complaints filed against police officers, uh, Chicago police officers. And when you go on that site, what you see is that there are many, many police officers, they have them by name, who have 64 complaints against them more. or more, right? Individual officers, dozens of complaints against them, often for the same types of things, who are still on the force. So everybody knows that's there. The officers are still on the force. What is the plan for getting rid of all of those officers, right? Where is the bold plan for disciplining them? Not on a case-by-case, one-off basis, but as a system saying, we actually don't think that they should be police officers anymore. And now that involves, obviously, there are systemic issues with the police unions that need to be dealt with as well. Um, but I think, you know, to give communities confidence to show up to those meetings and to participate, there has to be commitment on the other end that we're serious about actually changing things. We're serious about making transformational changes to the way policing is done, and we're going to bring you in and empower you to actually lead those types of changes. So time's getting tight, and I want to make sure we get some questions, but if anybody else who hasn't spoken can have a minute. Just three, three quick points here I'd like to make. Um, I, I do believe in, in police oversight. Uh, the city of Seattle does have a police commission. Um, the issue I have with it is it doesn't reach the folks that we want to be on, the, on that commission. Um, and some of the folks who are on that commission don't even live in the city. Um, so that's a bit of a challenge. But we do have oversight. Uh, this, the second point I want to make is, is that we do have um, what well, we, we've historically participated in President Obama's White House initiative on, on data collection. That's been taken down under the new administration, but there are a number of police departments that are still producing that data. All of our data is available on the Seattle website, seattle.gov uh, um, police. It has all of our arrest data, all of our contact data, as well as all of our discipline data. And, and the third thing is you'll see my name up there because I was recently, uh, I recently had a federal lawsuit filed against me by an individual. So you'll see my name up there with that, with, um, with that tag on it. The, the lawsuit claimed that I stole his idea for the, mo uh, for the movie Color Purple. So, but it, it is a federal uh, lawsuit that was filed. It, you will see my name on, on the website with that issue on there. So what I'm getting at there is, is, is that, yes, you may see names of officers with complaints filed against them, but you have to read the details. Uh, Chief Medlock or David Sklansky, do you want a last word? I, I see they're already hands up. Yep, I okay, let's, let's, let's hear from the hands. Yeah. I assume there's a, raise your hands high. Uh, so there's hands in, way in the back, and I feel like the back doesn't get called on, so all the way in the back, there's a woman who's got her hand up, waving it. 
Thank you very much for that panel. I'm Crystal Fleming. I'm going to be on a panel this afternoon where we'll be talking about justice and the possibilities for justice. So I have two quick questions. Um, and I have to say, as I was listening to the panelists, I had to do some of that deep breathing and uh, mindfulness exercises because I found some of what I heard, as a, it appeared as a, a, a fairly strong defense of stop and frisk. I found that extremely upsetting. Um, I heard a comment made on the panel that almost no intelligent person uh, or almost no one would say that stop and frisk should never happen. Um, I'm an intelligent person and I'm here to tell you that I do believe that stop and frisk should not happen. And my question for you is how many people of color need to be killed as a result of stop and frisk? How many bodies need to pile up before someone will say, maybe we shouldn't do this? I'm, I'm so upset that I'm shaking because I really want to know how many people of color have to be unjustly stopped and worse, murdered, before someone will be in a room with Jeff Sessions and say no? So, so that's one question. Oh, the second that's a big question. <laughs> Want to let us tackle that second question? second question is much shorter. And, and it's connected to the first. I'm wondering, everyone on the panel, is there anyone who actually believes that the police can exist in a situation of nonviolence, period, and specifically with people of color? If you think it's possible, why? If you don't, why not? So I, I just want to start by acknowledging not just yours, but the pain that I've heard in the room throughout since I've been here. And uh, it makes the conversations very complicated and fraught, but we still have to have them. Uh, and I think that uh, there are some answers to the things that you raised, and I just don't know if anybody wants to dive in. Well, I, I mean, since I was the one who said that <laughs> thing about no intel, I should respond first. I, I was wrong to say that. You're totally right to call me on that. Uh, and I, 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 there are a lot of intelligent people who think that we just shouldn't have stop and frisk. So I shouldn't say that you're absolutely right. Um, I personally think that uh, it, there are times when it makes, I, I think the police should have the power to stop people. At, and. I think that the police should have the power should have the power to frisk people. I don't think it should be used the way it's being used. I don't think it should be used as an aggressive form of proactive policing. Um, but but I also think that you could. I think there are. I mean, I I think there are lots of intelligent people. You're one of them. There are many others who would say that it shouldn't be used at all. So you're right to call me on that. Actually, can I yeah. just try to respond yeah. in a slightly different way that though I think it yeah. it's 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 very much on David's mind. Yeah. And and I find that there's just a lack of knowledge about this in society and I actually think it it it, it points out a problem that is natural to anyone in government. It's why we need checks in government. It's equally true of the police. So there's stop and frisk and there's stop and frisk. Mm -hmm. And what we've been living through is a perversion of what might be a police tactic that's used in an individual case where there is very there is very clear suspicion that can be identified. So the original stop and frisk case that went to the Supreme Court was a cop who watched somebody casing a jewelry store for a long period of time, a couple of guys, and he stopped them and they were armed and, and you know, it's, it's tough for reasons that I could get into about constitutional law, but we'll spare you about why that's a tough case under the Fourth Amendment. But it's a case where I think if we all sat and looked at the facts of it, we'd think, that was the right case. I mean, I do this with my students, many of whom are equally impassioned, and they'll say that was an appropriate place for law enforcement to intervene. But what happens in government and has happened with policing is the adage that my mother would use, you know, you give them an inch and they take a mile, which is that when the Supreme Court blesses things as tactics, then they become tactics that can be deployed as widely as they possibly can be. And once that happens, it corrupts the tactic, and it leads to the passions that we have right now. And I think well, that... But, but what, what corrupts the corrupts it is, again, a, an interpretation of the Terry rule that el eliminates the critical factor, which is you actually have to have reasonable suspicion. And you can't substitute race for reasonable suspicion. You actually have to have an observation of some activity that leads you to conclude that maybe something is up. And the, the absence of that critical factor, which frankly, 
prosecutors, and I'm a former prosecutor, prosecutors ignore, judges ignore all the time, and I can't tell you the number of times where we've been in court challenging a stop, a search, whatever it is, and that critical step that is very clear in the law is completely ignored, and it is not known, and is not taught, and it is not practiced often enough by police officers, and that, that absence is what leads people to challenge the legitimacy of the police and the complete disenfranchisement that so many people feel between their, their police departments. There's another hand in the back, right near the aisle. Oh, yep. I need a mic. But, Janetta, um, hey. Hi, I just wanted to call you for mansplaining the answer to her question. Um, after the first gentleman spoke, Everyone else who's actually in law enforcement probably should have had an answer and not the moderator. So I don't appreciate that because it's a very good question and I really would like for the police on the panel to explain the answer. And also, it's not coming from ignorance, by the way. The peer review research on stop and search does not give us great confidence in its effectiveness. So I just, I just want to be clear, my question isn't just coming from passion, although I am impassionate. I, I am passionate. But it's also coming from looking at the peer review data, which does not give us great confidence in its effectiveness. I think, yep, sure. Chief. Well, first and foremost, since I was in the room with uh, the AG sessions, I, yeah, I would tell you right up front, I don't support stop and frisk as a, as a blanket tactic. Uh, now, having said that, are there instances where it's appropriate? and you just heard the appropriate definition of when and, and how that should occur, uh, I think that's appropriate. Yes, sir. I, I, I agree with you. I, 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 I'm not sure why we're being called out because I, I don't think either one of us really staked ourselves on that, but I do support a Terry stop, uh, which is that, uh, that articulable, reasonable suspicion, but it, it is and has been over the decades since that uh, decision was made, it has been, uh, for, for lack of a better word, bastardized in law enforcement and the criminal justice system. I think as you just heard the moderator say, by attorneys, district attorneys, circuit attorneys, and, and the judicial system uh, as well. So yeah, I, I don't think we get a lot of bang for our buck uh, by, by just stopping somebody that's walking down the street uh, uh, given a, uh, the fact that the, the chief might have gotten heat from the mayor or a city council person, and it goes down the chain, I think, to Ms. Lightfoot's point of the division commander or, or, or the person over that particular geography saying, we're getting some heat in this neighborhood, go put the fire out. Mm -hmm. And, and if, you, if you only give cops um, hammers, Everything looks like a nail. So we need to be better as administrators in detailing and explaining and leading our people in what it is we want them to do. And also involving and engaging the neighborhood right. where these problems are occurring. Right. The neighbors are the ones that should be directing the activity of the cops, not the police chief. They should be telling the cops what the problem is and working with the cops in that neighborhood to, to deal with those problems in a not necessarily traditional enforcement uh, activity. Gentlemen, right, uh, there's lots of hands, so pick a hand, anybody has got a bike? Hand it to a hand. Uh, this question yep. is for Chief Medlock, is that how you say your name? Mm -hmm. uh, you made a statement about normalcy, about uh, people being normal that you train, and then they come in and you turn them into being abnormal. Um, whiteness and white supremacy, in my eyes, is a mental illness, and it doesn't sound like this is a, there's an accurate test for white supremacy, as the system has itself has been built on and fortified by white supremacy. So could you please explain what you mean by normal when people come in, because I don't know what, what you mean by that. And so many people have been excluded from that normalcy, so could you speak to that? So... I don't know if you noticed, uh, or, or a lot of you didn't, when I walked in this morning, I stood at the back of the room. And, and I was the person that had his back closest to the wall. Now, why would I do that? 
because over five, since, since 1979, I've learned that I don't want anybody sneaking up on me. And you know what? A lot of you folks look at that and say, well, that's crazy. We're, nobody in here is going to hurt you, Chief. I, I never thought that way when I became a police officer. But now when I take my wife to a restaurant or I walk in a room, I usually like to get the lay of the land as I did today. My back's against the wall. That's abnormal. When I take my wife to a restaurant, guess whose back is to the door? Hers. She's cover. I'm, I'm joking. Okay, but, but if you think about it, I've got to keep my eyes on everything that's going on uh, because that's, that's, what, that's what has... I've, I always have to be prepared to respond. And that's been my adult life. And I love my wife to death. I wouldn't use her for cover, by the way, most nights. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but that's those kinds of abnormal things. You know, we teach officers to know, generally know a question before they ask it. That's abnormal. Know the answer to a question before they ask it. We teach them cues of, of, uh, of deception. You know what? That, that doesn't work. That's abnormal. There are a lot of things that we do to, even going to, 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 to the point of, you're a police officer always, you always need to be armed, on duty or off duty. And by the way, I'm not today. Got a small pocket knife, I'm retired. But that's abnormal. Most people don't think about the last thing they do before they walk out the door to go to church on Sunday morning is to slide their gun uh, in a pancake holster on their, on their belt under their suit or in their pocketbook. Those are the kinds of things we take normal people and we teach them to be. And this is not, I'm not saying it's right. What I'm telling you is we've got to rethink the way we train our officers or teach our officers. We teach them to be hyper vigilant. And I've got to go a step further. Firefighters are hyper vigilant when they're fighting a fire. They're going into danger. They're, they're going in to fight a fire. They're hyper vigilant. Then they put the fire out to get on the truck. They go back and watch Oprah. And, and their hyper vigilance comes down. And that wasn't a slam against firefighters and Oprah, by the way. But, but cops, when they're in that car, 8, 10, 12 hours a day, have taught themselves through the culture and through our training to be hyper vigilant all the time. That's not normal. So, so I'm not... I'm not making excuses for, for, for what we've done. I'm saying that, that we, the collective we, have to work together to deal with, to overcome some of those issues that we have taken normal people and turned them into people that are always looking and prepared for danger. So I'm getting the signal from the sideline that I'm supposed to stop, but there are tons of hands, so we're here. Come on up and talk to us. Uh, talk to each other. There's more to come today, but thank you guys very much. And thank you. Yep. Thank you.